Uh, you know, it's been a little bit of work, but I'll tell you what, it's so fun because the conversations and learning about people individually and about what they're doing at their companies, especially given the last 12 months, is just fascinating information. And you, specifically to me, are sitting in probably one of the most exciting spots uh, in not just our specific industry in media and advertising, but frankly, just in how we're progressing as a society and how people are changing and shifting behaviors. And I even think about Warner Brothers and HBO uh, sitting from a place of you've never had that direct relationship. And I know we're going to get into that. But I think you just, you know, what you're going through has got to be just a delight uh, to be, you know, filled with challenges as well as, uh, uh, you know, uh, great, you know, wins and successes across the board. Yeah, I do feel fortunate to be both in the streaming industry and also in the data marketing industry. It's, I mean, it's a crossroads of things that are very, very, you know, hot in the industry. Um, and it's it's a lot of fun. Great. Well, Sue, let me, uh, just so everyone knows, uh, let me do, do a quick little background. So Sue began her career uh, as an analyst with McKinsey um, and Company. Uh, I think she began her career at 10 years old, too, from what I can read, if I do some quick back to napkin math. Uh, and then she was- uh, That's gracious of, of you, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then she went to uh, Cars Direct. And then she joined uh, Warner Brothers uh, Entertainment back all the way back in July of 2001. Uh, and as we know, Warner Brothers uh, uh, is the owner of HBO Max. And so she's been really with the company from 20 years. And it hasn't been a boring 20 years. Uh, with what's going on with everything throughout us. So we're going to get into a little bit of that. But uh, let me just say, look, HBO, it's an iconic entertainment brand, right? And you guys are sitting now on so much uh, content. I mean, that would make most people's head spins. And it's Warner Brothers, DC, Turner, Classic Movies, Cartoon Network. I mean, on and on and on. And so you... And before we get to kind of the HBO Max, I'd love to just begin back in, you joined back in 2001. Now, if I were to set, sorry, I have a dog barking. I don't know if you guys can hear this. Hang on. Ugh. All right. So I'm back. I have, I have two dogs too. So they might want to join the party <laughs> later. <laughs> so if we go back to 2001, you join at a really interesting time. Okay. This is what, six months uh, or maybe a year after the AOL Time Warner merger, where it becomes uh, AOL Time Warner and every and HBO fault rolls up through Time Warner. Um, and it's a tail end of the dot com boom. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff that early in your career that you are seeing from the front lines. Um, I'd love to just hear what that was like. I mean, as you joined it and going through kind of the ups and downs of those first few years. Uh, and then we can get to just, you know, you've seen this industry like a few of us have from so many different angles, every iteration, every innovation, and what that's been like, and what do you think we've got right? What do you think we've got wrong over the last 20 years? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, at that time, when I started at Warner Brothers, everything was changing. We called it online back then. I joined a division called Warner Brothers Online. And you know, like you're saying, it was kind of the era of the dot-com boom and bust. I had just left an art internet startup that had a huge boom. It didn't quite go bust, but you know, it was, um, all starting to settle down. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I didn't grow up in the LA area. So working at a movie studio was like just an incredibly exciting opportunity. I'd love to say that, you know, it's something I'd always dreamed of, but it wasn't even in like the realm of possibility for, for someone growing up in, you know, Georgia where I grew up. Um, mm -hmm. um, I remember telling my little niece, I think she was like a preschooler at the time that I was working at Warner Brothers. And she was like, are, are you gonna be a Looney Tune? And I just thought that was like so <laughs> cute. Um, but it was a time of constant change back then. Um, we were experimenting with a lot of different initiatives within like the online and wireless space. We now call it digital and mobile. Um, mm -hmm. and, but a lot of the things that I was doing back then were still the seeds of what I do now. We measured online traffic with original content. There was ad operations. We had you know pop-up ads back then on all of our content. Um, I ran a CRM team. <laughs> you know, there were so many pop-up ads oh, that came up all God. over the screen. I can't stand um, it. But, and you know, and we ran um, reporting or BI, and we were collecting and reporting on data on a lot of different initiatives, right? Like we were trying a lot of different things, a lot of different products. And I was just fortunate to be on the data side of things so early, even when it was just like reporting, right? Because 
um, all of that became increasingly more important and essentially became, you know, the industry it is now. Yeah. So, you know, you have the, or you, you, you I think you have the title or you definitely have the title all through your Warner Brothers career as really consumer intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a really interesting title to have really because, and, and I'm going to make a parallel here. If we think about CPG companies, okay, on, you know, they're trying as hard as they can to build a relationship with a consumer. And in many levels, HBO and, and, and Time Warner or Warner Brothers was in the same position. It's, you know, people always access your product through someone else's product. And now things have changed. And so you, it's almost as if you were in this perfect position to move into the role and the promotion, by the way, congratulations, uh, recently, but really helping drive the consumer relationship and connection for Warner Brothers content, specifically through HBO Max. Um, so can you walk us through the transition internally from moving to a content company at uh, the effect of others to now establishing that relationship and just how are you putting it all together and, and what's, what's the challenges and then you know, how excited are you guys internally today? Yeah, absolutely. Warner, I mean, we used to compare ourselves a lot to CPG at Warner Brothers. Um, Warner Brothers is historically a B2B business. Our movies go to exhibitors and they sell tickets to the consumer. Our TV shows go to networks, our DVDs and our consumer products, you know, the merchandise go to retailers. Um, we did have a seed of direct customer data pretty early on. You know, we had a CRM program. I remember back in the day, sending out newsletters for Lord of the Rings fans and Harry Potter fans and Looney Tunes fans. Um, and, and we managed that. Uh, we also had the website traffic that, you know, over time with the birth of DMPs and, you know, new ad tech tools became retargetable traffic for media. Um, and so we, we had a seed of consumer data that we started with, you know, a lot of the different initiatives that we had. And then we had to, and this is where, you know, the, um, the comparisons to CPG come in, we really had to work, we had to work really hard at creating partnerships with key partners um, for all of our different divisions to get third party data in, to match in third party data, uh, to fill in the gaps, like, you know, all the blind spots that we had from when we lost the consumer touch point. So we had to fill in those gaps so we could see the conversion for our media to make it smarter and to find out who our audiences really were. So we had to, you know, close that loop. You know, a lot of that is, you know, I'm sure you guys all know being in the media industry, you know, we built, we, you know, utilized clean rooms to match our data into, you know, retailers data or exhibitor data. You know, we, we did, we did as much tagging as we could. Um, and we, we just closed the gap. It had to be one partner at a time. I mean, it, it was, it was, it was a lot of, it was a monumental uh, amount of work. Um, but one of the most satisfying parts of my career at Warner Brothers, um, Consumer intelligence was a centralized organization. So we worked across all of the different divisions of the studio. So we would use points um, from theatrical and we use them for home entertainment. We would use you know, data from games and use it for studio tours or, or consumer products. Um, so we really created one consumer entertainment profile across all of Warner Brothers on behalf of the studio. Um, and that's how we sort of you know, really um, began our B to C relationships and you know our databases for consumer profiling for targeting and for segmentation. Um, so they really became entertainment profiles uh, on behalf of the company as opposed to like line of business profiles for each one of those divisions. Got it. So in theory, you know, I have a relationship, not necessarily with you know Turner, or not necessarily with you know the Game of Thrones, but I have a relationship with Warner Brothers and you have the ability to really understand how all of your products come together, you know, and community. And I think that probably extends through theme parks and through, you know, comic books and anything else right along those lines. Yeah, anywhere where we can collect data on the consumer or get yeah. data through partnerships. Um, yeah. It was, uh, it was a collage we had to put together of well, you know, consumer data. <laughs> well, I wanted, that's what I want to ask you. And I may actually have two just quick questions on this. But yeah, as I said, you've built the infrastructure. I mean, you've literally been every single new innovation in this industry hits your desk. You know, your you know, bosses are saying, hey, Sue, walk us through, you know, what's a DMP? You know, do I need a CDP? You know, how does all this stuff going to come together? 
<laughs> what's been, you know, what would you say has been the hardest so far? And then the B part of the question, because I love asking this, is that if I gave you a magic wand and I brought every ad tech and martech vendor in a big room and you could wave it and fix one thing about our industry that would improve your life as a marketer, what is the one, what's the one or two things you would just say, hey guys, get this right, like fix this for us all? I mean, I think every company you go to, I mean, you know, we've done a lot of recruiting for people who work in the space, right? And they all work with slightly different, um, a different version of an ad tech or a martech stack, right? Like everyone kind of is trying to strive to do the same things, but they have, you know, maybe a different mix of companies. And I would say the one thing that I would ask of our vendors is, you know, just to build out as many integrations as you can to other companies. You know, there are these mega companies that are building up, you know, that are buying up companies, you know, all across, you know, the funnel of the stack. Um, right. And those companies don't necessarily talk to each other yet. And then, you know, there are companies, you know, even if they're independent, you know, they, the more integrations you have, the easier it makes it for us, the easier it makes it for us to slot, you know, you in as a company into the rest of our stack, because we know it'll work with the other vendors. Um, and I think they're increasingly starting to do that, but it's still, it's still hard. When, when they don't talk to each other, it just creates more work for our marketing technology team, more work for our data engineering team. Um, it just takes longer to get things up and running. Yeah, and I think that that's the lack of interoperability today, I think tends yeah. to still be one of the Achilles heels of our industry. And then when we've got data sitting in different spots, it not only creates more work and, you know, reduced efficiency, but at the same time, it, it opens it over inaccuracy. So <clears throat> I think we tend to see that quite a bit. Um, the, I want to move into, or I guess follow up last piece on the, on more the CPG analogy. As you've built really worked hard to get to that last mile and touch the consumer. If you were you know, working for another company who was in a similar role, what's the number one piece of advice you could do that you've learned and how to really establish a relationship, not just a transactional, hey, I've got your data sitting inside of me. What, what are you guys looking at um, in the future? I, mean, I would say you always start with your goals and requirements. Right, like you can, if you start with the data and just start doing things, I mean, there there's so much that can be done and it's just, um, it's a never ending list of things that you could do or that you could try and match or that you could try and track. Um, and so that's why I think every company has a slightly different stack and, you know, maybe different companies that work in that stack because each one is different based on uh, what the goals are for the company. So at HBO Max, you know, our goals are acquisition and retention. We're a streaming service, we're a subscription service. So we have to get folks in the door. We have to get them to sign up and subscribe. And then once they sign up and subscribe, we want to keep them for as long as possible. And knowing that that's what our goals are, you know, that's what I build the MarTech stack around. Um, I have to build it around, you know, tracking the media in, tracking our marketing in, knowing what's working to get them to hit that subscribe button. Um, and then, you know, I want to be able to track what they're doing once they're in our service and find what those key drivers are to keep them there. You know, what content want, makes them want to stay? Um, you know, what, what types of features make them stay longer and have longer lifetime value? So I think it all starts with really the goals of the company and what you're trying to achieve. Great. The... <clears throat> I think HBO Max, I believe, was announced in 2019 or 2018, I think, something along those lines. It rolled out, I think, officially in 2020, right? May 27th, 2020. Yeah, May 27th. The day that's like ingrained in my head. <laughs> <laughs> God. Well, May 20, yeah. So I guess about a month. Yeah, well, no. Uh, yeah, it'll be uh, one, year. one year. Yeah, it'll be anniversary. Yep. Well, that's. And that's phenomenal, right? So HBO Max, and we I, I'll decide not to cover off on the HBO Direct, HBO Now. I think I had like five logins to HBO products, but I couldn't figure out exactly which one was which and when I needed to use one versus another. So I actually love HBO Max, uh, a huge fan of it, probably spend more time on it than anything else. Um, in the last uh, announcement you have, there's 44.2 million subscribers, which 
I think would be just considered a smashing success in any new product launch uh, within a within a 12 month window. Now they say uh, I think there's something like 18 million of those were direct activations, meaning that they you they weren't accessing you through others. The rest of them came from an AT and T relationship or possibly a cable based relationship, if that's correct. <clears throat> um, and it's generating already. I think I think you're on the run rate of close to four billion dollars um, relative to this relationship, which is which is fantastic. Um, as you look at HBO's Max's position in the industry relative to all the other streaming services, um, you know, how does the, the executive team feel? Are you guys on track today? Uh, you know, how do you see the ability to continue to grow? Because it's a premium brand. And then I'll just also ask, you know, competitively, if you guys look at the matrix, you know, Disney's obviously come out now with their, uh, you know, streaming service. I don't know how many ungodly amounts of streaming services I'm paying for. Just uh, how do you see HBO Max sitting inside the ecosystem? Where do you guys take this, you know, over the next two years? Uh, mm -hmm. And just, you know, are people happy with the success so far? We are, we are really pleased with our numbers. Um, we have grown more than 11 million subs since launch. And this is US only right now for us mm -hmm. at HBO Max. Um, you know, our creditors, a lot of them are reporting global numbers. Um, so we've got a lot of momentum coming. We have a lower priced ad supported product coming, uh, an offering coming in June, and we'll be in 60 international territories by end of the year, which is keeping my team very, very busy right now. Um, so we're, you know, anticipating a lot more momentum on top of the momentum that we already have. And, you know, we're just really pleased with where our service is right now. <laughs> That's right. I, I thought for a reason, I maybe wasn't allowed to ask you that question, because that was a topic that I really wanted to dive into a little bit, which is that, you know, I, you know, well, life I, is I can't go into too many details. I get, Those I get are it. I get it. Officially, but... <laughs> I get it. But the fact that you said that you're because <laughs> it, it is something that's, you know, I, I'll just put it out there that I and this is for everybody on the phone who's in advertising, right? We talk about the purpose, you know, one, you could say we work in digital advertising or we work in advertising. And a lot of people say, well, that sucks. I hate digital advertising and blah, blah, blah. And we go into reasons why that's true. <clears throat> but if I always look at it, I go, look, the, the beauty of the advertising industry is to think about what the world would look like if advertising didn't exist. Advertising and brands specifically fund uh, journalism. And through that, we have really democratization of news and content for everyone, which is a really good, good thing. But now as we're cutting the cord and I'm adding up all of my subscriptions to my streaming services, uh, to my news and information services, it's incredibly expensive. Um, and so I, I was going to ask about just HBO's perspective on ad supported content so that more people can have access to it. But it sounds like you guys are already on your way and and that's already in the plans. Anything else you can share yeah, about uh, the ad supported version? There's Was that a difficult? There's nothing else I can share right now. I would say stay Great. tuned in the next few weeks to find out more, but we're excited about our launch in June and to offer the service to, to more people out there. Wonderful. Now let's go to AT&T. Okay, so um, let's see here. What was it, 2017 when this was officially approved? 2018, I think, officially approved by the Fed uh, or the FTC. So AT&T now owns, what is it as a marketer, okay? What's it like, you know, what are the benefits to being actually underneath a telecom company with, you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of, of people to be able to have access to that you didn't have access to before? What's that change for you? Yeah, um, I mean, it's an, and it's not just AT&T, right? It's our sister companies around Warner Media. We just have a greater pool of first party data to tap into, uh, a greater pool to you know, look at our customers, our customer profiles, what they do, what their entertainment profiles are, but not just even entertainment profiles, like what their households look like as a whole. Um, that helps us build out prospect models, that helps us build out you know, models on where the opportunity is to you know, um, get more subs. Uh, so just as a whole, um, across AT&T and Warner Media, it just a large pool of data that we can pull from uh, from direct consumer businesses. On top of that, um, you know, AT&T has a huge network of retail stores. 
I think there's one on her. Um, my daughter broke her phone a couple weeks ago. She like dropped it into the pool. Um, and so we had to walk into an A&T store um, to get her a new phone, a very expensive new phone. And, <laughs> you know, we walk in and there's HBO Max promos everywhere. And, and you know, she's like, she's so cute. She's like, mom, HBO Max. And I'm like, yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's great to have that sort of support um, across AT&T and their retail stores, you know, also across their media. It's just a great benefit. So it's, I do look at this world in which, and I still think that we don't know exactly globally what is going to equal first party data. It still actually isn't totally defined on what, who actually can have access to or what that means and then what we can we purpose with it. But if you look at this tie up, right, there's so much that makes sense about it from everything from I have the cell phone information, right? And the traffic and the apps and what's going on there. I have UVerse, which actually can understand what I'm consuming. I have the app, which allows me to actually customize content and really personalize that and all of that, that it feels that if you can bring all of those things together, that there's a big advantage today uh, for this tie up, you know, which I guess was probably sitting behind it. But, uh, you know, as you guys think about just bringing all of that together, and if we're at a baseball game, are you in the first inning, second inning uh, of being able to tie it all together? Oh, like, you know, we have uh, an amazing team at HBO Max. We've uh, brought in a lot of really experienced and diverse people from multiple industries and multiple walks of life. Um, and this is what we've been working on from the beginning. Um, you know, data, having a group like mine that is focused on data, consumer data specifically for the use of media and marketing. Um, and, and, you know, it wasn't just starting at HBO Max. Again, you know, we started a lot of this work even when I was at Warner Brothers. Um, but we've been looking at, you know, the consumer data across our landscape for some time. Um, and so we're pretty far along. I would, I mean, I would say we have a best in class marketing stack and we have access to a lot of data. Um, HBO Max is, uh, it's, it's fortunate to work at a, at a streaming company where we see, uh, we, we, we can see the full consumer 360 profile, right? We know what they clicked on in their marketing, if it's digital. We saw what brought them in to subscribe. We saw what they viewed first, which is probably a good, you know, uh, proxy for what drove them to subscribe in the first place. We know how long they stay for, we know what they watch over time, and we know if they turn out and what their activities were like before they turn out. So we have this wealth of data um, that, you know, I did not have access to before in some of my, you know, former jobs. And, and it allows us to do a lot of, you know, sophisticated data science modeling. Um, and so I feel like uh, as an organization at HBO Max and across AT&T Warner Media, uh, we're very, very sophisticated in what we do in the data and marketing space. Um, how much does inside of uh, the Warner Brothers and, and HBO umbrella, all of this is coming back, right? All this, the stream of data is coming back. You have the ability to use that for communication purposes. Um, from the media perspective, as you look at kind of the omnichannel approach to reaching people who, you know, may not really be aware of the benefits or why, or I should choose this over this, um, you know, as this is, a, you know, really just an innovation summit relative to brand marketers. Do you have insights into omnichannel? What's working really well for you? You know, what hasn't really worked well? Um, and how do you enact that first party data to help define where you're going to spend your marketing dollars? I mean, off, off your properties. Yeah, obviously. you know, I, um, yeah, I was tuned in, you know, to, to a few of these sessions earlier, and I know someone from your own company, you know, was talking about identity. Uh, identity is key for omni-channel marketing, right? Like, you have to know um, that you're targeting the same household and the same user across multiple devices. Otherwise, it's it's wasted media impressions. It's, it's wasted marketing everywhere. Um, it also uh, helps to put together, um, to have that identity as a backbone to really be able to look at your media across, you know, do, to do uh, multi-touch attribution because otherwise you can't tie those together. So, 
you know, our goal is to always make our media in particular, right? Media as efficient as possible, as efficient and targeted as possible. I mean, really that's everyone's goal here in the digital marketing space. Um, and so we just, you know, we have to do everything we can to tie it to a household or, and even a profile within that household because we have profiles, you know, within our HBO Max service. So you can see, you know, what different members of the family or, or different people are watching um, in the household. Um, and so it's just really important to be able to tie that all back to a person or to a household. Um, so we have a good idea of um, how much media they're consuming, how many times we're touching them. You know, we don't wanna be able, you know, we don't wanna, I mean, you guys know, we are all in media. Like you don't wanna have 30 ads going to the same household just across, you know, four different devices or four different services across Facebook. Or and, have the same ad know. play back to back uh, inside of a carousel, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, which we've obviously seen a lot. So the frequency side of this is, is really critical, obviously too. So I wanna maybe move a, a question a little bit in advance uh, as we think about the next, I'm gonna call it five to 10 years. And I've got a perspective, so I'm gonna spring something on you. And I want your, your reaction that, uh, we have spent so much money and time on what I'll call the pipes and the method of delivering an ad and tracking the ad. And we haven't spent anywhere near the amount of time on the creative side of it. And I fundamentally believe that creative is the most important piece to anything. It doesn't matter how efficient I can deliver an ad. It doesn't actually matter how well my targeting is. It's really going to be about the creative and actually how the creative is actually accepted and received, okay? And I, and I believe creative tech and the investment uh, in creative tech is gonna be one of the biggest stories over the next uh, 10 years. <clears throat> My judgment is this, I feel we're going in the wrong direction relative to television-based advertising. And you could call that programmatically enabled um, or uh, broadcast. But because of the ability to now buy CTV or programmatic television, it opens up something that wasn't available to us before. And here's the contrast. And when I was buying broadcast, okay, by definition, I have a lot of waste. Unless I'm selling toothpaste, okay, you know, if there's any product that's at a certain audience, you know there's a level of just reach you're hitting and it's wasteful. But yet you have to pay for that audience because you're competing with other folks for it. And so because of it, we went from, you know, we went from 60s, you know, or 90s to 60s to 30s to 15s. And we're seeing, you know, uh, you know, I think six second things every now and then. That to me feels the exact opposite way. And here's what I'm going to uh, put out. And I'd love your thoughts. And because of programmatic, there's a carousel, there's a spot, there's a time frame, whether it's 120 seconds or 180 seconds that sit in there. Now, because I can reduce my waste, okay, I can specifically target exactly the people and exactly the households and the individuals that I know I want to reach and talk to and hopefully buy my product. I love short films. And if you've ever gone on and looked at three, you know, you can make me cry, you can make me laugh, you can move me within a three minute time frame, and you can do a whole episodic commercial in that. I would love to see a world in which that commercial break isn't something which I try to ignore, it annoys me, but it's also moving in line with, why don't we have three minute episodic where I actually enjoy the commercial as much as I'm actually enjoying the show and that the tenor and the tone on the feel of the commercial is actually in line with the feel of the, the television show that I'm watching. That to me, I would love, and you know, we're looking to test that uh, you know, with a few of the uh, clients we work with. What are your thoughts on creative um, as a part of the mechanism for you as you look at uh, the marketing you guys are doing and the future? I mean, we're we're a content company, Sean. I mean, there's nothing more important than creative, right? It's uh, the the versions of creative that go out to to represent the different content and the IP we have. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes people pit data and creative against each other, and that's not true at all. Um, we use our data to surface the creative that resonates most with people. I mean, you know, I know in our 
kind of pre-discussion with you, like, you know, you're into documentaries and, and political commentary mm -hmm. and shows. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, you see the creative that is, um, that is relevant to you. I mean, I kind of like like the sci-fi fantasy shows, you know, I watch a lot of kids content with like kids, you know, so we we're always testing different creatives in media. I mean, everyone should be right. We have so many different versions of creative going out all the time um, to immediately identify which creative is resonating and which one isn't. So, you know, we as a data team, we never tell our creatives what's good and what's bad, or what's wrong and what's right. Um, we would never do that. Um, especially at a, at a studio, at a content company. It, it's really about, you know, letting them know which creative is resonating with different populations. Um, and, and I think you were talking a little bit about linear, you know, we, we all use linear, you know, up to a point, but at the end of the day, we're a streaming company. So a lot of our, um, a lot of our targets, a lot of our fans or prospects, they're not even on linear anymore. Uh, Streaming tends to be younger, um, certainly more digitally savvy. And so, uh, you know, over time, you know, we tried to replace, you know, some of the linear with more digitally, di digital ads, which, which is more measurable. And we can, you know, swap out a lot more creatives. We can do it more real time. Um, Cause you know, once you send kind of your creative out to, to, um, your commercials out to linear, there, there's not a lot you can do to change on the fly. But, you know, if you've got it out on, you know, Google or YouTube or Facebook, you know, you can immediately see what's working and what's not and, and swap things out. So we're always a very creative left company. Um, I, I love your idea of, you know, making commercials, you know, advertising part of content. And I think that's coming, right? Like the next wave of advertising is really going to be I think because of some of the limitations that we're going to start seeing around audience targeting, um, it's going to be a lot around contextual targeting, which I 100% agree, you know, we should all be, you know, moving towards anyway, it should have been always a combination of contextual targeting and audience targeting. So I think we'll definitely start to see that in the industry. And it sounds like, you know, you're on top of that, too. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, hopefully, it, you know, I would just ask is you guys really think about the carousels and the spots and how you guys are going to work on that that the beauty of it with programmatic and specifically as someone you know who owns and operates a dsp that we you know don't have the limitations uh that uh, other systems have and so i think the ability to actually find the right audience deliver it and do more episodic emotional things is really important if anybody wants to uh be fascinated there was a, i did my senior research paper on this <laughs> called the mood congruence theory. And it's really incredible relative to advertising that if the mood of the commercial actually is in line with the mood of the content that I'm consuming, I have high favorability ratings. On vice versa, if I'm watching something that's melodramatic and I've got a you know auto dealer on my screen yelling at me, I have a negative perception. And so I really feel like figuring out this way to match the content and the mood of the advertising in line with the show is going to really help uh, you know, just a favorability score and get people much more interested in being, and I want, I want to get this to a place where people actually aren't annoyed. They actually look forward. They're like, oh, wow, what's this mm -hmm. next story going to be for me? Imagine that that's the place we could get ourselves to. I have, um, uh, we've got just a couple minutes left. I want to just end on, uh, this idea of measurement. Okay. And mm -hmm. how can, you know, HBO Max or, you know, you know, more at t time or it's not at t time ordering, but Warner Brothers. Um, we're going to know so much, right? We're going to know this audience got, you know, met with this. How do you see measurement evolving uh, for brand marketers over the next two years to five years? And what excites you the most uh, relative to the capabilities? Yeah, I know that there's some um, consternation in the space right now with like the iOS 14 launch with, um, you know, the, the, the coming loss of the cookie. Uh, we, we feel like we're in a, a good spot. Again, you know, the access that we have to our own first party data, our own customer profiles and what they're doing. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's something that doesn't quite concern us as much as I would have, you know, back in um, my old company at Warner Brothers. Um, because we we know who our consumers are and we know what they're doing. Um, 
with measurement, it's media and measurement. It's always, you know, the kind of struggle is getting the big walled gardens and trying to, you know, tie your consumers uh, between the two to really get an idea of um, the uh, kind of reach and frequency that you're getting. Um, you know, just, you know, I know we just had um, Facebook on, you know, but like between Google and Facebook, how many times am I really, you know, hitting, you know, this one household or this one user between these two networks? Um, so, you know, that's kind of the ever, <laughs> the, the, the constant, you know, problems that we run into when we're trying to do our more sophisticated modeling, um, when we're trying to make our media more efficient. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't really see um, a real solution for that, like a, a, like a, a real solution. We, we do a lot of um, data science and modeling to get around it. We work with some partners, you know, to do what we can. Uh, but I don't think it's really anything that anyone has solved in the industry at this point. All right. So I know we got Alan coming in, so I know our time's up, but so I'm going to last ping on this one. Mm -hmm. When I started my career, I used to walk around with a uh, laptop computer in the mid nineties and I would have to plug it into a fax machine at clients. And I'd have to say, this is what the World Wide web is and sit down and talk to them about it. And I would use <laughs> this analogy for advertising. I would say, it, in the not too distant future, you're going to be watching Larry. And I remember using Larry King for whatever reason. I've said in the not too distant future, you're going to be watching Larry King live and you're going to love the tie that he has on and you're going to be able to just mm -hmm. mouse over it um, and you're going to be able to purchase the tie. It's now 2021. Interactive. I mean, this level of interactivity, right, with the ads via my even computer or television still hasn't actually arrived. Is this something that, I mean, just any thoughts, is this anything that you guys look at, think about how could that actually really take place inside of all of the assets that you guys have to make it a little bit more just, yeah, interactive and, and engaging? Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen some early, um, we, we've done some early tests on that sort of thing. And I honestly, I feel like it's all driven by the consumer. If it's really something that, you know, the consumer wants and that, you know, a company can capitalize on to make it feel like part of the value proposition, I think it'll happen sooner than later. I don't think it's the tech that's holding us back there. Great. Well, Sue, thank you. Uh, exciting times for you. Congrats on the wonderful success uh, over the last year. Really appreciate your insight and best of luck uh, as you move forward. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, Sue, and thank you, Sean. You did a yeoman's job. You moderated three panels there. I need to introduce you. I want to point out one thing. I need to introduce you to Zev Neumeyer, who's the product man lead at Vizio, because he has a very similar idea to you about having the advertising match the context of the show that I agree with fully, where he's even down to like, you know, the showrunner should specify what brands or what types of brands should be advertising on the program so that it all stays as one piece. You know, right yeah. now, our, the, I mean, right now, the problem with getting hyper-targeted with streaming is all, there often isn't the size of the, the audience isn't really there yet. In other words, give it a year or two, but a lot of times when brands try and use their first party data to match, 